Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of UCalgary's Community Webinar Series. We're here to talk about food, more specifically about how the food gets to our tables, and the goal is to bridge the gap between rural and urban knowledge about the agriculture sector, from farm farming to processing, and all the steps in between that results in food being on our tables. I'm Deborah Yedlin, and I'm your moderator today. If you've participated in one of our previous webinars, welcome back. And to all our new viewers, thank you for joining us. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are recording this webinar on the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Kani, and Kanai First Nations, as well as the Tsutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We started this webinar series at the onset of the pandemic. Our aim was to inform and support our community by connecting them with COVID re research and resources. More than a year later, we've expanded our focus to include a wider variety of topics, but our purpose is unchanged, to share and discuss knowledge and insight from guests and new Calgary experts with our community. Together, we can use research and facts to take on the challenges that face us. Over the last year, we've gained perspective seen a bigger picture. When grocery stores were suddenly less full than expected, many of us started thinking about the supply chain as it relates to our food supply. Where does our food come from? Who makes it? How does it get here? And what aspects of our society and economy rely on the agriculture sector? Alberta's economy was dependent on agriculture until oil was discovered in 1947. I'm sure many were surprised to realize how little they knew about their food's journey from farm to grocery store shelves. And now more than ever, it is important to understand where our food comes from so that we can make smart, sustainable decisions about what fills our fridges and nourishes our bodies. UCalgary is not widely known as an agriculture university, but our impact is significant when you put all the pieces related to agriculture together. Animal health, medicine, science, technology, and public policy, our community is helping to, helping, helping to deepen that impact. The Simpson Center, made possible through a generous $5 million gift from Calgary rancher and businessman John Simpson, was established in 2020 to strengthen and support Canada's agriculture and agri-food sectors through focused, evidence-based, practical policy analysis on trade, the environment, and innovation. We recognize agriculture is a major component of Canada's economy and has significant potential for growth. We are here to make that happen sustainably and responsibly. And this year, the Creative Destruction Lab Rockies, which is powered by philanthropy, launched the Agriculture Stream, and, which is supporting the growth of seed stage science and technology-based startups in the agriculture and food space. It's the only CDL ag stream in the country, and it has captured a lot of interest from the founders, fellows, and associates involved with the program. I'm delighted to be joined today by three guests who bring with them diverse experience within the agriculture industry. I'd like to first welcome an internationally recognized expert on the behavior and welfare of a wide variety of species. Dr. Ed Pager is the director of WA Ranches at the University of Calgary, Anderson Chisholm Chair in Animal Care and Welfare, and Professor of Animal Behavior and Welfare in the Faculty of Vet Med. Also joining us is UCalgary alumnus and intrepid entrepreneur, Ravinder Minhas. He is co-founder of Minhas Brewery and a member of the Calgary Stampede Board of Directors. And finally, I'd like to welcome a fourth generation rancher with a passion for driving innovation and changing perceptions of agriculture. Sherry Cobbathon Barnes is, is Chief Executive Officer of CL Ranches Limited and a member of the Calgary Stampede Board of Directors. Welcome all and thank you for being here. Please keep in mind that audience members can submit questions or comments at any time throughout our discussion by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. And we'll get to as many questions as time allows. But before we hear from our guests, I'd like to share a short video about UCalgary's WA Ranches. This facility is transforming education and research in the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine.
apologies for that. We seem to have had uh, some challenges with the, with, the, with the audio portion of the video. Maybe we'll be able to, oh, no, we're gonna start, try again, okay. As well. Through this gift, we will generate a create an enterprise, an infrastructure, a platform where students and academics, policymakers and private sector stakeholders, as well as common citizens will come together to understand the relationships between animal health, human health, environmental health under the lens of One Health. One of Wind Chisholm's great passions is uh, the welfare of animals, especially the welfare of the cattle that she was raising. And one of the reasons she donated the ranch was to make sure that that continued. And the expectation is that it would be maintained as a working cow-calf operation. So what's happening is that the research is kind of fitting into the activities at the ranch. Same thing will happen when it comes to educational opportunities. If we want the students to get experience checking on pregnant cattle, that'll happen when it would normally happen at the ranch. For research, it's a great opportunity for the vet faculty to perform clinically based practical research out there that producers can use, as well as to give them opportunities to collaborate with other faculties, such as people in the Faculty of Medicine, Business, Engineering, looking at new technologies, as well as environmental concerns. It will allow the community to be involved, so we will be able to bring out young children between kindergarten and 12th grade to come out and learn where their food comes from and how their food is produced and how the beef production system actually works, as well as provide an opportunity for 4-H students to come out and learn about um, current beef production systems and producers as well to learn about the cutting edge research that we're doing here at the University of Calgary to improve beef cattle health and welfare. The opportunity that the donation of a ranch provides is just incredible. It really is a gift for everybody in Alberta in the sense of learning more about the cow-calf industry. So it's an incredible donation from a very generous family. Thank you. I think that's a, it's a great video to introduce uh, the topic that we're, ta we're, we're addressing today and really providing a real farm context for learning research and community engagement. We know agriculture is at the heart of the Calgary Stampede and the Stampede's roots go back to Cal Alberta's pioneers who wanted to showcase their very best crops for their customers and the world and to the world. Much has changed over the more than 100 years of the Calgary Stampede, but one thing remains the same and that is the care, commitment, and passion people who live on the land have for what they do. So let's meet some of those people. Well, agriculture has been the lifeblood of uh, the province of Alberta and the Calgary region. Probably some of the most pristine ranching country in the world. Highly productive native range that uh, is very, very good cow country. Agriculture is the ownership of livestock and the workmanship of animals. It's a lifestyle. It is a lot of hard work. It is 24-7. We do what we do because we love what we do and we love the animals. We all truly passionately love our animals and we want them to have the best quality of life possible. That they're treated with respect and care, and especially for what our family does. They look to us for everything. I mean, we bring them their food, you know, clean their stalls. I mean, so we do have a, quite a connection with them and they have a connection with you. We're their friends. There's just something almost magical or majestic about a horse. We love taking care of our animals. We grow attached to them and that attachment makes us want to treat them better. And I think it's really important for people to see how well animals are treated. And I don't think there's any better example of that than the show community. What I do is called Liberty Horse Work. So it's kind of a natural form of horsemanship where we communicate with our body language and our voice commands, and the horses are free of reins, bridles, saddles. What we run here is basically it's a training camp for horses. I mean, so what they're doing is getting in the physical condition plus the mental condition to do what we ask them to do, which is show and be in front of a group of people. When I do show, there is a lot of pride there. This is my flock. This is what I'm producing, and I want to show that to people. I love showing cattle. 
you get to work with them and see them progress over time and see that end product and know that you put so much effort in and that effort paid off. Initially, the Calgary Stampede, and still is today, an egg society. We have virtually every species of livestock available to see, whether through competition or showcase. It's amazing to see all the people come through and for different reasons. It's what the organization stands for and represents. It's our Western heritage and values, which are truly multinational values. I mean, they're family values. It is so important what the Calgary Stampede is doing with putting such a spotlight on our agriculture and the Western heritage. So it's a major, major part of the Calgary Stampede. Always has been, always will be. Oh, this is a lifestyle choice through and through. So you gotta love what you do and like them in order to do it and do it successfully. I do what I do because I love working with horses. It's my absolute passion. The only one word that it boils down to is passion. I love it actually. I mean, the opportunity to raise some good cattle and, and be part of an industry that uh, is worldwide. Uh, no, Alberta beef, it's the best beef in the world. In terms of hanging out with my friends, I, I, I think I'd rather hang out with my steer. <laughs> I just can't imagine a life without horses and wherever that road leads me in the future, as long as I can be on a horse or working a horse, I'll be happy. That's a great video and of course if you go west of the city these days or south, there's lots of calves and little sheep and kids in the in the fields now as we see the cycle of, of, of uh, the spring start. and all the new livestock starting to be, be visible. And also, I think it's all important for us to all remember that Stampede is not just a 10-day party. It's about the agriculture and how this all comes together and how Alberta is such an important part of the food chain and the food supply in this country and potentially around the world. So um, we are going to get into the, the uh, questions right off the top. And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Pager. Uh, you know, I mentioned at the t at the beginning, you know, people don't think of the University of Calgary as an agriculture uh, focused university. How has the donation of the WA Ranch has changed this perception? Um, how has it benefited the university and how is it benefiting the ranching community? Well, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Chancellor, for the question. And I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. The donation of WA ranches is really a transformational gift to the University of Calgary. Maybe I'll just say a little bit more about the, the ranch itself. It is a 19,000 acre commercial Black Angus operation. It's located 20 minutes north of Cochrane or 30 minutes from our Spy Hill campus where our Faculty of Vet Medicine is located. That is an incredible location because it makes it really, really practical for us to be able to take students and classes out to the ranch in a very timely way. And and maintain a, an excellent uh, kind of schedule. It's not a ranch that is located a couple of hours away and it's very difficult to, to get to. This is, uh, the location is absolutely wonderful. The ranch itself has a thousand mother cows and 65 bulls. We also crop 2000 acres. So right there you have a whole range of different types of opportunities. I was, for example, I was just contacted by somebody in a uh, faculty of science who was interested in doing research on grains and forages and what that type of activity. Um, the ranch itself is, you know, uh, when it was donated, it is clear that it is a, uh, although it's under the stewardship of the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. It really is a gift to the University of Calgary and to all faculties. What that means is that there's an opportunity for multidisciplinary research to be done. And in fact, that's one of the expectations that we will engage with all kinds of different faculties. Faculties themselves will, will generate their own type of research areas and, and interests. For the ranch itself, um, through our strategic planning for the ranch, we kind of identified four principles or four areas of work that we will focus on. The first being animal health and welfare. Um, as you saw in the video, it is a passion of the donors, uh, the issue of animal health and animal welfare. It's one of the very few things that was highlighted in the, in the actual gift agreement and donation that that be a focus. That along with youth development, which is also uh, a very key important area that we're working with. Um, a second area of emphasis is kind of the human livestock wildlife interface. So it kind of deals with more with the people working on animal disease transmission, wildlife disease transmission back and forth through cattle, 
Third is preservation of ecosystem diversity and function. So dealing with a lot of uh, ecology and ecosystems and understanding the relationship with water and soil and land and ranching. Um, and finally, it is the um, uh, experiential learning opportunities that the ranch provides. So as you can see, there's all kinds of different areas that go across multiple faculties and create huge opportunities. In fact, I like to um, consider the ranch, uh, the ranch of opportunities actually. So the ability for us to take students from all kinds of different faculties out to the ranch and have them do hands-on work. Um, and that can range from, we had people from landscape architecture out before COVID shut us down. We've had our, our own vet students out, had conversation with people as broad as, you know, English and nursing and wanting to come to the ranch and run classes. So it really has created opportunities here within the University of Calgary. Um, we also look at the ranch as a, as a place to do community outreach. That community outreach is, uh, can be for ranchers, for veterinarians, but also to bridge this kind of rural urban divide that exists. And one of the um, guiding principles of the ranch, yes, how it contributes to the ranching uh, community itself, um, it is to do research and teaching that would benefit ranching in Alberta and across Canada, if not the world. Uh, the work we do isn't limited, it is national and international in scope. Uh, it just happens to be done here at the University of Calgary. And there's a lot more um, grant applications and research activities that are being submitted to national uh, granting organizations uh, in order to allow our faculty to do work out at the ranch. Just a, one question came in and, and it's from a, one of our, our participants. Can a Haskain School of Business student come to the ranch? How are Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, when we think about when we think about the use of the ranch, we think about going across all kinds of different faculties. Um, you know, how do you attract people to agriculture? Well, it's not just about ranching. There's a whole business side to ranching, which is probably yeah. even more important. There's entrepreneurial activities. Um, this summer, we've hired students from engineering to help us develop new technologies for uh, uh, for ranching. So it is very, very broad. We hope very much to be working with uh, with Haskin and other organizations such, such as Workland as well for on the education side of things. Uh, working with the Simpson Center is a, a real key component. We've actually submitted uh, uh, grants together already. Um, so policy uh, kind of, we look at the ranch as an opportunity to integrate multiple, multiple interests and, and, and faculties, uh, as well as the community and our ranching, uh, ranching community as well. Thanks, Dr. Pager. Ravinder, I'm gonna to go to you next. Um, of course, you're in the beer business. We think of beer, we think of Stampede, but there's more to it than that. Right. Um, tell us about beer and barley and Alberta and what we, what, how you are, you know, how does that figure into your business and, and um, the Alberta, bounty of barley that a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, so I've been in the beer industry for 21 years now. Um, started here in Calgary, but couldn't afford uh, to build our own brewery. So we went to a brewery in Wisconsin. And I had hired a, a brewmaster out of the Cebu Institute of Brewing, uh, and he was based in Chicago. And so we started to uh, define what our first beer was going to be called Mountain Crest. And uh, he put in the in in the, basically in, in for the brew what the uh, what you know what the malt characteristics are going to be and where it was going to come from and he said Alberta, and I said to him you know what look I know Alberta to Wisconsin is a little far, um, so don't patronize me don't do it just because uh, you know that I'm from Alberta and born and raised in Calgary he goes no I didn't do it for that I did it because you said you, the description of you wanted of the beer needs the Alberta malt. And, um, and so we've always used Alberta malt, both in our Calgary facility and Wisconsin facility and others. Um, and so little do we know it, not only, I think, I know most Canadians and Albertans know we have good brewing malt, but what they don't know is we have the best brewing malt. And right. so, um, and so that is something that is uh, amazing to me that um, is, is, isn't, you know, we should broadcast it more from the top of the mountain, uh, how good our brewing malt is. And, and frankly, I'm not the only one that does it. Um, and so there's other breweries in California that only use Alberta malt as well uh, for beers that only sold sold in the U.S. So um, for me, it's a it's a story that uh, that is a really important one and uh, gives a crisp and clean taste that the majority of all beers are looking for. So um, to me, the biggest export is not oil. It's barley. And of course, people don't understand, don't know the story of barley. And we know that there's some gaps in terms of how we talk about agriculture and what it means. And so, Sherry. What don't we understand 
uh, when it comes to how food gets from uh, the farm to the table, from the ranch to the table. What do we need to understand? What gaps do you really see us as needing to close? Well, it's just exactly like what, what Ravinder just explained. We know that we're the best beef producers in the world. We're the best barley producers in the world, but we're so siloed in what we do as producers versus our connection to the consumer that we we don't have the ability to really tell our story very well. And so what we've seen happen over the past, I'm gonna say, oh, probably about eight years or nine years is that as producers, we've started to talk to our end users such as Ravinder or such as McDonald's or the, the, the big companies that actually have the ability to amplify our story. We We've been doing things right here in, in Canada, in Southern Alberta for hundreds of years, but we just haven't been able to get that information out. And that's why one of the things we've learned is that we need organizations like the Calgary Stampede that have access to over a million people who walk through their gates or through the likes of Ravinder's company or McDonald's, who've got these massive communications departments and budgets, I might add, that have the ability to tell our story on our behalf. And we're also learning that when you have someone else tell your story, there's a lot more credibility that goes along with that from a consumer's perspective, believe it or not, than if just I as, as a rancher told the same story or a farmer. We, we are seen as being trusted entities, but when it comes to making consumer decisions, it's gotta be a pretty good balance of what they see on the shelf versus the story that goes with it. So there is a risk to that though, because you let someone else tell your story you lose control of the narrative. So how do you find that balance to make sure that the story that's being told is the one that you want to be told? Because we know Absolutely. it can go the other way. Absolutely, and, and the trick is to build the relationship before it ever gets to that point. And the relationships are built by a, a solid understanding of the entire value chain, whether it's barley or whether it's beef or whatever the product is is that those that are telling the story truly need to understand how it's produced. And in my case, for example, I had McDonald's come out here. It was May, 2014 was the first time they ever stepped foot out here. There was three feet of snow on the ground. And so we were starting to talk about how do we market this wonderful concept of sustainable beef. And they had this big list of ideas that they thought was gonna be working, but it was great to be able to open up the door and say, okay, you want me to be able to have time to fill up a whole bunch of paperwork for you versus save that animal that's under three feet of snow. So it was allowing them to see firsthand, hear firsthand what happens, and you learn to collaborate in what kind of stories and communication that, that's effective and win-win and in both cases that helps both of us through the, the entire process. So, you know, this, this, um, this the, web, the University of Calgary is hosting this webinar, and you're both on the Stampede board, Ravinder and, and, and Sherry. So could you tell me how, what is that Stampede, Calgary Stampede, University of Calgary, and how does this all fit together? And how does the university support the Stampede? And how does the university work with, uh, how does the Stampede board work with the university? Yeah, I mean, I think if I back up just a touch and go, well, so why am I on the Calgary Stampede board of directors or why I volunteered many, many years ago? Sure. Um, and truthfully, it was because I was frustrated that as much as we were telling the story of barley and wheat and, and why all these why these why is why is an Alberta great place for agriculture, my US customers, um, Trader Joe's, Costco, 7-Eleven, Walmart, um, totally couldn't understand it. And I was going and looking for resources. And when I was looking for resources to share with them that showed unbiased stuff, well, I landed in the International Agriculture and Agri-Food Committee and was asked if I would volunteer. And I went, uh oh, another board. Um, to volunteer. I don't know if I necessarily need it. Well, I met Sherry and a, and a bunch of the other board members and I went, oh my God, this is the resources I've been looking for. Right. And plus, I think together we can amplify our voice because we're coming from two different directions. And so many, many years ago, I joined that committee and I, and I see Maureen's got a question that came up as well yeah. that said, could we do farm tours to this area? And I think that's brilliant. But one of the things we did when we were on International Agriculture Committee was actually arrange farm tours for people that were coming to visit the Stampede. So for me, it was a great conduit in to understand the other side. I learned more about beef and cattle and the different styles and types 
Um, uh, I, I guess I'm going to learn how to ride a horse here soon, um, but uh, for maybe a parade. Um, but so it was, so that was kind of my one conduit in, and then it, it brought in my horizons and said, there's a lot more of the story we can tell. Yeah. I think it's the same thing when it comes from a UFC perspective is, is that uh, Bojit Singh, who was the, uh, uh, yeah. the previous, and there's a close friend of mine, um, you know, I didn't realize what everything that vet, what, what the veterinarian group was doing at the UFC. Uh, and I'm embarrassed to say that. And so it was uh, because I didn't know that part. I don't know, I'm an engineer from the UFC. You would think I pay enough attention, but I guess my attention is always going to Haskane and, and to the Schulich side. So uh, I think in unison, and having that conversation brings more credibility for all sides. And we have a, I mean, the University of Calgary does have a presence at the Stampede on the grounds and working with the Bulls. How, how what, what else does the university do to support the Calgary Stampede? Well, the university is involved in lots of different ways. They have classes that actually will have a, uh, uh, will spend a number of days at the Stampede uh, out of the uh, Social Sciences Department. I can't remember exact name of the uh, name of the course. They have uh, opportunities for vet students to be participating in the care of animals with such as chuck wagon animals and Bronx and those types of things. We have a booth at the Calgary Stampede, very similar to what Ravindra was saying about being able to tell our story. Um, you know, we have been around for about 15 years now, but every now and then we still meet people. And it wasn't that, wasn't that odd, you know, five, six years ago for people to say, oh, is there a, is there a vet school in Calgary? I didn't know that there was a vet school in, in Calgary. Um, so we have a presence there. I, um, I was asked to join the um, An Animal Care Advisory Panel at the Calgary Stampede about uh, 10 years ago, I think the first year after I came. And the reason I said yes was because they asked and they asked to improve, that they wanted to improve animal care and welfare at the Stampede. Um, and basically I said to them, if this is window dressing, I'm not interested. I get calls all the time about getting involved with companies and other organizations. But if you wanna make a change, if you wanna make something, wanna make a difference, then I'm happy to come and work with you. And through their activities, they have kind of developed really which, what is the probably only, um, but also just a top notch animal welfare care auditing program at the Calgary Stampede and the University of Calgary is involved with that as well. So there's lots of different, lots of different ways, all the way from educational opportunities outside of the vet school to opportunities for our veterinarians, advisory, uh, advisory to uh, opportunities to them. And we call on them to help us uh, reach other communities, uh, people that we want to reach out to as well. So we didn't have Stampede last year. We're still not sure what's gonna happen this year. Has there been an impact in terms of that connection um, because of the because the event didn't happen? What's the impact of of not having had uh, Stampede last year and the uncertainty facing the event this year? So I guess from my perspective, I just say that, that you know the, obviously the opportunities for cut for 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 students aren't there and those types yeah. of things. Um, uh, I think the larger the larger impact has been. Um, uh, just on this on the stampede side itself in terms of the cuts that they've had to have to have to take yeah. um, leaving less time for um, some of these other activities and trying to figure out how they're going to keep going forward um, but it has there has not been any type of negative impact no. other than just simply the lack of the lack of the uh, lack of opportunities due to the COVID situation the same way it is for our for our, for our own students being able to go up to the ranch for example we can't take them out there so that's an opportunity lost there as well. Yeah, so it's an engagement factor. Another tremendous area that was lost due to COVID, outside of 10 days, Calgary Stampede hosts Aggie Days. Aggie days yeah. Yeah. And that's a tremendous educational tool for so many of our, our, the, our ability to be able to really show the, the urban population, the urban students, more than 18,000 a day go through there. And so oh. it, it, that was a big loss to us. Yeah. Um, I, Sherry, I just want to continue with you because there's something that's starting to get more and more airtime. We're hearing sort of snippets and some more um, uh, sort of visibility, but I don't think everybody understands what regenerative, or what regenerative agriculture is, how does it affect farming practices, how will it affect farming practices, and why is it important? Regenerative farming, the terminology itself is, is controversial even in our own eggs oh. world. Okay. And a lot of that is because in many cases, many of us have always been managing under the principles that you primarily hear of it. And that's really about taking a holistic look, starting from the soils upwards and how you produce whatever the product is that you're, you're producing. 
And it is a term that's new and there's no doubt about it. Many of the, the big companies like to hang their hat and politicians as well on this new terminology that really has, isn't new to us in the business, but it, it, it is one that helps people understand that even as a rancher, as a cow calf beef producer, regenerative farming to me means that it's more than just my cows and calves. I'm looking at the entire environment that those cattle are raised in and making sure that every component that I have control or the ability to improve upon is something that I am first off measuring. You need to know no different than in business. You can't fix and, and improve upon something you're not measuring. So learn what layers of the strata you need to be looking at. The technologies are, are developing almost on a weekly basis on how to do that. And so it's really about being able to come up with tangible measurements or metrics to, to really show people and, un, and help both me as a manager as well as our consumer understand what it is that we're doing. Ed, do you want to add to that at all? I think it's it's a fundamental concept in our strategic planning for WA ranches is the, is regenerative agriculture going through one through a, a one health approach. It's also a really important component as we move forward and interact with various faculties, uh, where we are looking at the water, the soil, the air, the animals type of thing, kind of that, uh, as well as the people, kind of taking a one health approach to uh, to this ranching question. Um, I'm, I'm talking to a number of people who are interested in developing projects around sustainability, around regenerative techniques such as multi-grazing systems, and there's all it's a whole list of things that people are, are working on. But fundamentally, uh, you know, I think the ranchers have done a great job in terms of what they, how they manage their ranches and how they appreciate the land. Um, but it's like every every business, there's always things, new technologies, ways to get better. And I think the University of Calgary is here to help move some of those questions forward and develop some of those technologies and and uh, with an eye towards regenerative agriculture and making making healthy products and uh, a, a proper ecosystem uh, balance. So we know that, um, you know, if we are going to feed 9 billion people on the planet by 2050, things are going to have to change dramatically. And let's, you know, Ravinder, from your perspective, you know, beer consumption's going up, barley, we need to increase barley, the growth of barley. What, you know, I guess from your, from your business perspective, what do you need to see changing in order for you to meet the demand for your products that you want to create and sell? Well, I think first is um, we were a global world and still are to a large extent, but because of COVID, that changed where people were thinking about where their products were coming from. Mm -hmm. uh, if you take an example of ethanol and hand sanitizer being the biggest example, uh, we always relied on south of the border and other places, uh, but you know, ethanol was created from barley and wheat. So there was this, is there shortage? And, and so suddenly the consumer is looking at what's in their own backyard, who's mm -hmm. open, where is this growing? Yeah. Um, and so for that, uh, and that conversation really amplified itself to local, I think it's about a necessity and then some recognition that the borders are closed and shipments are not coming. So from our perspective, what came from that too is how are we gonna get greater yields and more consistent quality, right? And so how are we gonna use technology and how is, how is agriculture in general and then food processing and then us are gonna do it so that we can get better yields on what we're doing. Not only does it bring us more competitive to the marketplace, but there's a necessity when that just sheer amount of volume and, and land space and farm space is not growing. So um, that, is a, um, that, that, is, that is something that the industry definitely looks at, but I think that it's already started to occur. I, I, we feel that, um, that, that the, those that are farming and those that are, that are manufacturing that are already starting to take those steps to figure out what crops, when and where, um, and how to get better yields out of it. So it is fascinating to watch the food science side. I'm nowhere near as smart um, to understand it all, uh, but I can definitely see what the byproducts are. And I'm excited for this, the next technology that, that, that so many are working on to continue those yields. So, uh, Sherry, Ed, I'm sure you have uh, something to add. And I also have a question to follow up once you're done. You bet. I mean, from the agriculture side, the, the answer is, is a double-edged sword because we're very good at, at creating new genetic um, varieties of whatever the product is and, and developing new techniques to be able to produce it. But we're also facing an increasing amount of, of criticism based on, on things that are not necessarily quite so tangible. So it's really difficult as a producer to take the risk of, of trying to do what we're supposed to be doing, and, and that is producing more food, because yeah. you're never sure what kind of political backlash you're going to get from a, a left, and it's, uh, that's not a fair statement. You're never sure what the repercussions or unintended consequences that you're going to be faced with because you're trying to do the right thing. 
So that's what's made it. There's a lot of folks that are have a lot of um, trepidation about trying new things to help improve because you're not for sure where you're going to end up in that capacity. Right. And, and I think, and I think, I mean, I think the university has a really important role to play in this discussion, right? Because hmm. what you what you have is you have a lot of opinions on one side, you have a lot of opinions on the other side. You know, sometimes it's propaganda and anti-propaganda, sometimes it's just different perspectives. And I think it's really important for the university to take the role of saying, okay, so what is the information? What is the data? Let's have an informed discussion. Let's bring people together and talk about what the facts actually are, what the science actually shows, and kind of be part of that, be part of that discussion by bringing knowledge and facts to the, to the discussion table. Well, so and, and to that point, I guess that, you know, you, when you read um, anything these days, you know, we're, we're all focused on reducing emissions. And of course, there's a focus on energy, there's a focus on mining, and now there's a focus on agriculture and emissions created through agriculture and particularly through livestock production. So I'm wondering how you, how do we address that? How is it, is it the way the livestock are raised? Is it the feed that they are given to reduce their emissions? Where are we in terms of that, A? And B, the second part of the question is, are there um, partnerships that could be struck with you know, energy producers, such as what we're seeing in the US with, um, with Chevron, looking to, to uh, create re uh, renewable natural gas? So I'm just, I'm really curious uh, to see, to hear what you have to say about some of the you know, it doesn't matter where you read, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, emissions, livestock, agriculture, you know, that, that, that the lens is on the sector. Yeah, so I guess from my perspective, I think it's, it's really important to understand the contribution made by various parts of uh, agriculture to things like emissions. All food production has some sort of environmental impact, whether that be through transportation to a retailer, whether that be through um, the use of water in different areas. Greenhouse gas emission from cattle is uh, is is known to occur, of, of, of course, but the percentage uh, that which it actually contributes, I think, is quite a bit smaller um, and and less impactful than many people believe. It's very easy in these discussions to simply pick out a particular bad hat, uh, you know, and, and kind of attack a, a particular industry. Um, I'm not sure that that's really uh, the, the, the most helpful approach because again, it doesn't allow for any um, good discussion around the science and the facts and the contribution. It also, one of the voices that is also always missing is the voice of um, the improvements that are being made. You know, the amount of greenhouse gases that are being produced now are much less than they were 10, 15 years ago from cattle, uh, just mm -hmm. in, in terms of improving efficiencies and those, those types of things. There are lots of people doing work on developing uh, feed additives, for example, that may result in decreased greenhouse gas emissions. Right. Um, so there is an awful lot of activities and research going on to address this, this issue. And the thing that people probably don't know is that a lot of it is paid for and through grants through industry organizations themselves, recognizing that this is something that they can they can be improving upon. Sherry, you're on the front, you know, you are on the ranch. And I'm just curious how you're seeing this narrative unfold. I was reading in the Financial Times today, you know, livestock produces 14.5% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's Once again is an incorrect figure that has been taken from something that was back in 2014. This is the frustration that we have. And, and this is why it, it takes something like the WA Ranch that you can use as an industry as, as a showpiece if you want. We need the credibility of the research that's going on around the globe, firstly, because that number in, Cal in Canada, livestock account to 2.4% of all total global greenhouse gases from Canada. So, I mean, it, it's not a, a global issue. They can't keep calling these things global. And we're, we're trying to change that dialogue a little bit at the global level to help people recognize that, that this really is national in scope. If we really want to fix the globe overall, we have to first focus what we have and change what we have here at home and do it in ways that are credible because we have to also remember that this is a business. I need to be economically viable. As much as the video was great because it talked about the passion at the end of the day, we have the passion and it's also our livelihood. 
And so we're trying to do the right thing is if we do things incorrectly, the environment's not going to treat us well either. It's to our benefit to make sure that we're treating all aspects of the environment and our animals to the best of our ability, because at the end of the day, it pays for it in the, in the, pro, the pounds that we produce. So it's, this is where we do need something. WA Ranch is situated in a beautiful position because it, it, it is replicating real life. And it's done so on a platform that is elevated because of the university's attachment. And it's done so under the scrutiny of all the other departments as well. It gives us that much, us being agriculture now, the credibility of being under that eye. And, and Dr. Pager is doing a fantastic job of really making sure that the research that's going on out there is very relevant to these real world problems that we're facing every day. So a question from uh, one of our, um, our uh, attendees about to each of you. Can any of the panelists envision a larger role in consumer education uh, that the University of Calgary can take, perhaps in partnership with the Calgary Stampede, and, and so that research can be gener better understood and consumed, you know, understood by the general public and by consumers, and by extension, they can make the choices they need to make. Ravinder, I'll start with you, and then I'll go to Ed and back to Sherry. Yeah, I think um, one, one of the, the most important roles for a university and then to end with the Calgary Stampede because it gives a great outlet to show it is is digging into some of the topics deeper. So if it's uh, if, if it's if it's beef cattle production and why that's important from a protein perspective for the world, if it's alternative proteins, if it's barley, if it's beer, it's a matter of picking some of those and that's highlighting it. And, yeah. and, and, a, and I think in a lot of ways, utilizing the University of Calgary for its credibility to be able to put that down but put it into a way that the average person, you know, let's say walking through the barns is able mm -hmm. to understand it. And so instead of it coming from the producers themselves, or it's coming from us that benefit from it because we're in the food and beverage industry, it's, it'd be, it's amazing when it comes from the, from, from a university or a university of Calgary. Uh, I think that's, 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 uh, I think that's a, a huge opportunity that we have. It's just a matter of identifying which the, which, what is the right one. Yeah. Um, what, and, and, and if, and if I was to look at it today, I would think it's, I, I think it's proteins over, over everything else. And I think, um, that conversation of, of alternative proteins, the conversations of lab made and the conversation around organic or not organic or not hormonal as a burger chain is doing and, and, uh, and a lot in the industry. So I'll poke, um, is that it's, you know, it's created by a marketing team and it's not necessarily fact-based. And so, or it's giving the assumption that others aren't doing that. And yet we know that they are. And so the whole industry is that there's nothing special, different about their beef, but it, it, it's going to be amazing for that to be something developed from the University of Calgary. Ed, I'm sure you've got lots more time to do something like this, right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we're working on it. Oh, I have a, this, is a, this is a fantastic university because there are so many willing partners and uh, and faculty members who are who are interested in jumping in. Consumer education is a is a very important thing, but you know there are different ways of it for it for education to occur, right? I mean, you can tell the story and and tell people what it is you're doing, but I think something like WA Ranches allows us to give people the experience. You know, can we bring X number of people to the ranch? We hope to be part of Open Farm Days in the in the near future when, when people can, when the consumers can come and visit the ranch. We're in discussions with the Calgary Stampede on their 2050 program and how can we partner with them and maybe create some opportunities for students to come out and come out and visit. Um, it's also, you have to be realistic. Uh, you can't have thousands of people running all over the ranch, all over the place. So maybe it's an opportunity here to uh, bring the ranch to the consumers. Um, and not just so they, can, so, so they can actually see what, what happens. I mean, coming out to the ranch is fantastic. Um, to be able to see the land, the water, the care, and the effort that people put in that raise animals is absolutely amazing. This, you know, being able to give animals uh, great welfare and the amount of time and, and energy they put into making that happen is pretty impressive. Um, uh, especially this time of year calving season, especially if it's a calving season when you have three, four feet of snow like it was last year. And yeah. I, I was out on the ranch uh, uh, many, of those, many of those days for a research project. And the amount of effort that these people put in is just absolutely incredible. And I don't think people actually understand that as well. I think Sherry can tell us a little bit about that as she's living, she's been living it for a while. <laughs> Um, sure, I actually want to switch tracks a little bit. I mean, we talked about initially about how protein demand is increasing around the world. And where do you see Alberta as having the potential to 
increase cattle production, we often look at our province as being able to be an important part of feeding the world. What do we need to do in Alberta from a protein standpoint, uh, you know, whether it's livestock or crops, to make sure that we can actually help feed the world? That's a bit of a loaded question because a lot of it has to do with politics and not actually our ability as producers to produce the product. We have the capacity here in Alberta to produce as even more than we are today. What we're lacking is the infrastructure to get it to the world efficiently. And so whether that be through value added processors, whether it be through improvement in, in transportation corridors even, or, or even a lack of, we're not competitive even from a regulation perspective internationally in some cases, and especially in, in beef, for example. So we need to do a better job of really understanding where we're non-competitive and where we're unable to, to deliver. Like if you want to even go, well, we notch it down a level. Right now we have a tremendous amount of investment going into the province of Saskatchewan for, for our, our uh, canola crushing plants and things like that. Mm -hmm. Currently in Alberta, that type of investment is difficult to accomplish. And so it's, it's a matter of really trying to understand uh, where the where the, the difficulties are from a, a new and an innovative perspective, how to get through some of this regulation and red tape that we're, we're facing here in Alberta that's not necessarily national in scope mm. versus what can be done on an international level to also expand our ability to, to have more customers. And so just, you know, I, I just want to go back to that sustainable, uh, this notion of sustainable agriculture and sustainable beef production. And, you know, how consumers are making their choices based on certain on, a, on based on their values. And so do we have an opportunity to brand our agriculture production, whether it is crops or beef or any sort of livestock um, as differently than other, to, other products offered in the global market? Is that something that would help us? Is it realistic? And it's just as much about telling the story and just, is it as much about telling the story about how we raise our livestock and produce our, our crops you know, Ravinder said that people don't know that our barley is the best in the world. Uh, so I'm just wondering, how do we, you know, is it is it realistic from a sustain to, to brand our agriculture as sustainable, and what does that do, or is that just completely? Honestly, it's it's more um, do it, it's more doable here in Canada than probably any other country, be simply because of our size. Because we're only in the beef industry, and that's what I can speak most finitely to. We're dealing with only sixty eight thousand producers. So to be able to start coordinating production practices is much simpler than if you tried to do it in the states with seven hundred and thirty eight thousand producers. And the same would go with with the United uh, with the European Union. So we're sitting here in a position to be able to help deliver the type of product that needed to the marketing and the consumer shelves but it's not as easy as you think because we still do have to the traceability issue is is very cons, uh, quite a costly concern in order to be able to maintain and track from farm to plate if you want to call it that way and as much as consumers are always it, it, there's a, a real dichotomy between what people want to do and what they actually do with their pocketbook as well and so when you start to recognize what the, inf the, the costs are to, to maintain that traceability, to maintain that product and the integrity of that product, a lot of consumers aren't willing to pay that. And that's where retailers have to get into that niche market concept. Now, yesterday, just, just yesterday, Walmart has announced that they are going to be showing or putting the sustainability sticker on their beef, which is wonderful news. But it's due to a fact that we're, we're allowed to market products in, in a format called mass balance because the marketers and regulators understand that in order to, to create drive, we've got to get the product on the shelf. So therefore, in order to allow us the opportunity to get there, believe it or not, mass balance, which is a concept that's used by coffee, cocoa, palm oil, in order to be able to call it certified anything, there only needs to be 33% of the actual product in the blend. Of a, and that is of a, day's, of a day's production. So that's not overall, that means that that day, at least 33% of the product that went through the plant was from certified sustainable. It allows enough product to hit the shelf to get the market driving so that you can't, you don't go right out the get go and try and produce a, or put a, a product on the shelf that you know consumers won't be willing to pay for. It's just, they're not quite there yet. So there's a great question that just come in uh, from Amy Peck and she asks, she'd like to know Ravinder's thoughts on the incredible opportunity in Alberta to highlight the sustainability story that exists between beer and beef where cattle consume the waste products from brewing 
or barley that is damaged by weather and upcycle them into beef. This could also demonstrate the integrated nature between plant and animal agriculture and the relationship between those systems. Over to you, Ravinder. <laughs> I mean, That's absolutely. A great question. I feel like uh, Amy may have some background in this. Um, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Maybe she I likes mean, your beer. Maybe she like, yeah, likes beer and, and beef. Me too. Um, so absolutely. I think that the, the I mean, you know, I always looked at what, what are some examples of success? And some of the examples of success is avocados, right? Uh, 15 years ago, they weren't very excitable. They were a hard with a big seed in it. And it's marketing that has brought that to everybody's pate. The Asahi berry is another one. Hard seltzers is another example of that. Um, there's, there's so many examples in food and agriculture where a group or a territory or tequila, or the, you know, the French are the best at this, right? So we take their brandy, we make it in the Cognac region, and now suddenly it sells for four times the premium. You take their sparkling wine, you put it in the Champagne region, you call it Champagne, right? So it's so, so there, there's this there's this story that needs to be told, but really at the end of the day, the beef you know is eating the same barley that we're brewing beer with, and it's coming from the same land. And so it's it's a story that we can integrate, uh, and you're able to talk about so many different things when you spearhead through that. Now, as a person that owns a television and film production company, it sounds easier than it actually is. Um, also from getting out that education, uh, I'll point to the energy sector, which we think is, you know, we live in oil country and we think that Alberta should be better at telling its story. Uh, we've seen firsthand experience what happens when it doesn't, uh, because they all point fingers. Government points fingers at industry, industry points fingers at industry associations and government. And at the end of the day, nobody, everybody's counting on somebody else to do the education. Uh, but we can see the power when they all get together and, what, and what, what can happen when it's there. So if you can get the brewing industry, which is large enough on its own in the beef industry and everybody to get together and to tell this story, um, you put the facts in front of people, I'm sure they're going to go to both. So I think it's an amazing opportunity. It's just a matter of who and how. And, so maybe, uh, maybe you should be partnering with uh, Sherry and uh, the barley producers that you uh, use to source your malt. Make a great this is this is very true. I mean, yeah. uh, Sh uh, Sherry was instrumental in bringing in the uh, McDonald's to the Calgary Stampede family and, a number of years ago, and through our agriculture and agri food because we saw that linkage. Um, you know, and it's uh, and it's something that's definitely a, a, a great opportunity, no question. Yeah. But I guarantee anybody who's drinking in a beer tent over Stampede Week does not know that linkage and that potential. This is very true. That's that's not being given. Um, you know, we, we we talk a lot about data these days. You know, data, data science. Uh, that's as much about tracking uh, production, food security, etc. How is how is um, how is data and data management sensors? How is that affecting the agriculture sector today? And how is it helping food traceability? Ed, I'll start with you and go to Sherry. Sure, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of that, uh, technology that is being developed for agriculture today. Um, everything from artificial intelligence uh, systems to, to uh, robots, et cetera. So if you think about the dairy industry, many of the dairy farms in, in Alberta actually have milking robots. And so the, the dairy cow actually goes to the robot to be milked as identified. And at the same time that's happening, there's all kinds of other measurements that can be done using sensors that will tell you about the health of the animal and those types of mm. things. Um, in the, uh, uh, in the uh, swine industry, people have developed technologies now to actually uh, uh, analyze vocalizations of animals to determine how healthy they might be or if they're in distress or not. People are using technologies uh, to identify animal emotions in order to actually identify animals that may need to be treated for some sort of illness. Here at the University of Calgary, we're actually uh, launching a new initiative, which is referred to as an emergent, uh, which is using new technologies in three different ways, one of which is animal agriculture. We have research projects going on uh, next month that will be putting wearable sensors on young calves to look at uh, identify potential illnesses earlier than is done clinically, so that we can actually get to them, treat them sooner, use less antibiotics and those types of things on them. We're doing some work using collars on large bulls to track their behavior and, and some other practices as well. So it really is changing the whole face of agriculture. Many ranches, um, you know, at the feedlot, they can use mon they can monitor animal behavior and movements again for the same type of thing of identifying animals that might be in trouble. And then even in large expanses, like in Australia, they, they can track animals and where their cattle are and are they where they're supposed to be and 
and and do that type of thing. So it is really trans transforming agriculture in lots of different ways. Cow calf ranches, not quite so much, and that's one of the areas that we hope to develop at WA Ranches is is actually a cow calf operation. You know, cow calves are off on big pastures, but often they're in the foothills of the Rockies, which has have lots of trees and other other things that make it a little bit more difficult. But with solar panels and other opportunities, there's it's uh, it's not too far off, I don't think, and, I, and we're hoping that University of Calgary will be a leader with that through our engineering group as well. Sherry, what are the barriers for you to adopt the technology that Ed's talking about? I mean, that's is that's an easy question. It's cost. There's it no cost? doubt about it. And, and that's why we need the universities to really be refining for us on our behalf, if you want to call it that, which technologies we should be focusing on. Because I guarantee you there's not a week goes by and I don't see 10 or 20 new different products that someone's wanting to try out here or wanting us to use because it's going to be the next and greatest. But the, the reality is in the cow-calf business, our our return on investments are very small. And oh. so we don't have very, very little to negative amounts of ability to be able to, to really invest in, in technologies when it's when you're not sure of the outcome. Everything we have to do, there has to be a guaranteed outcome, which is a horrible thing to say, but it's reality of the business yeah. we're in. Sure. So it, it's a tough one. And what about the role of government? I'm curious as to what your each of your views are in terms of promoting that, you know, adoption of technology and sort of helping sort of facilitate more trade trade opportunities as well um, and create that sustainable um, uh, label if you want. Uh, where, where does the government stay in all this? Because they did allocate a fair number federally, the federal budget didn't have a lot of money for agriculture this, this last, uh, last month. So I'm just curious as to where you see the, the federal government playing and supporting you going forward. So I guess from I guess from my perspective, I'll speak uh, to it from the supporting research activities, and there is a there are some major grants that are available for that. So I think uh, the government does have a role to play. Uh, so something like Alberta Innovates, for example, we actually have one of our projects funded through Alberta Innovates, um, and there's other types of opportunities. But um, I think I do believe the government needs to be involved with helping develop some of those new technologies as well. Or else you have a university that ends up being a place where you know things like beta testing is done for other companies rather than developing the technology itself, right. which is really where the, the university should be. Sherry? From my perspective, I think it's really important um, when, when we look at the consumer's concerns over some of our research projects that are going on, if industry is in fact funding some of the dollars that go into some of the projects that happen at WA, for example, they automatically assume a bias. And so it's really important that there's an equal blend of, of research projects that are going on that are, are completely arms free from industry investment. And that, that needs to come from government at this point. Provender? I mean, I think both the provincial and federal government have, have, have great opportunities um, to lead a role in this. If you look at the brewing and, and distilling industry, um, when the federal government and the provincial government decided that manufacturing of alcohol beverages was something that they wanted, uh, both in distilling as well, but how many mm -hmm. breweries and distilleries popped up. Right. Um, and that was because there was incentives and opportunities, but also a reduction of red tape to get there. And so uh, I think it's them identifying where an opportunity is and then uh, putting it there and in a lot of ways getting out of the way. Um, and so that's, so the dollars are there, but sometimes it gets spread too thin. Uh, I don't envy those positions though, because like Sherry said, everything sounds like it's going to be the latest and greatest and the most cutting edge. And so I'd hate to be the one to go through those proposals and decide, but I do think that there's, there's some very obvious ones. And, and I hope that some of the dollars that earmark start to find their way um, to those kind of projects that, um, that in the long term are really going to benefit Canadians. Well, we're at the top of the hour and I'm going to just close this webinar. I just want to say thank you to all three of you for your thoughts and your um, responses to my questions. Um, clearly, it's, you know, the agriculture sector needs to tell its story better as well, not unlike the energy sector. So maybe there's some cross uh, pollination that could happen there as well. But I'd like to thank you for being with us and sharing your, your thoughts about food and agriculture. I mean, if there's one thing people have done in the last 50 months, they've connected with their food supply in a way that they haven't in a very, very long time. And so that's why we wanted to do this webinar. If you've enjoyed our discussion, uh, all the people that have just, uh, opted to participate on the webinar, I encourage you to visit um, ucalgary.ca forward slash community where you will find more webinars, podcasts and stories on topics that will matter to you. And uh, thank you everybody. Thanks Sherry Ravinder and Dr. Pager for being with us today. 
and uh, we'll see you next time.